Hey, welcome back to the Metropol Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, so this is Terminal Directive, the campaign expansion that just came out on Thursday, just last week. And we are here just rounding up, uh, finishing off the runner cards. We're on the Shaper side. And then we have, I think, two neutral cards on top of that. Uh, if this is if this you're listening to this for the first time, uh, firstly, we're not going to talk anything about the campaign spoilers. This is just talking about the cards as they exist in constructed Netrunner play and like the tournament scene, the casual scene, stuff like that. And I'm also um, not at all going to talk about any spoilers about the campaign experience. I haven't played it yet. It's going to be impossible for me to do that. Um, got a lot of cards. That last video is pretty long. So without further ado, let's start here with Isla Bios Rahim, the Simulant Specialist, not the Stimulant Specialist, which is upsetting. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, this is no link, 45-15, so 45 deck size, 15 influence, very standard, a natural identity. Um, before drawing your starting hand, look at the top six cards of your stack, set four of them face down as NV RAM, and shuffle the rest into your stack. And then at any point in the game, you can spend a click to add one card for NV RAM to your grip. Yo, that's really cool. That's a really cool ability. Um, I like this a lot. Now, admittedly, I don't play a lot of Shaper, but this is almost immediately comparable with Andromeda, the Dispossessed Risty. And this is the criminal identity that's probably been the most competitive in Netrunner and has probably seen the most play at top tables. The idea is with Andromeda, you start with nine cards in hand. Um, uh, and you see these cards when you mulligan, and uh, that's actually really important. You also have one link. Now, if you compare that to Isla, she doesn't start with nine cards in hand. She also doesn't get her NV RAM until after she's mulliganed. Uh, Oh no, you can do it twice before you draw your starting hand. Look at the top six cards. So that happens twice, right? Like you get two NV Rams. What? Really? Before drawing your starting hand. Yeah. Wow. So you can mulligan your NV Ram or does your NV Ram not get mulliganed? Not sure. I think we need a UFAC on that one. That one isn't out yet. So kind of play it how you want, I guess. But the idea is with Isla is you have your five hand size plus four cards in your NV Ram. That's very similar to starting with nine cards with Andromeda. Difference being they're not in your hand, so if you want to go find them, you have to spend a click. You spend a click to draw them, but you actually get to pick the one out of the four. You don't like draw the top one after you shuffle that pile. So it's like identical to drawing from your deck, except you know what you're drawing. Andromeda is really good, and the bigger reason why Andromeda is super good is setting up turn one, getting your card draw down, getting your like run engine econ down, like your uh, your desperados, your security testings, all that is super viable, so you can set up super fast. Isla is a bit slower than that, but she has an ability to get like she has access to all her options and if you're running these sort of cards that are referred to as silver bullets cards that are specifically good in certain matchups uh, or specifically useless in other matchups i think isla does that pretty well um looking at the top six cards of your deck and then picking out four intelligently and saying either i want these in this matchup because they're going to be very important or on the other hand saying these cards are going to be dead and i want them out of my deck just so that i can draw into better things i think those are both like very reasonable strategies and I'm really excited to see Isla play because I think she actually encourages interesting decision making uh, very similar to how I think um, Steve Cambridge is pretty cool because it's going to have a lot of cool decisions um, and I'm really excited for Isla um, I think Isla naturally just caters more towards combo decks and if you've seen on my channel I've been playing a lot of Severnius uh, Combonius decks playing with certain Severnius Stim implants which is why I was excited about the Stimulant Specialist but I misread. Um, and I think it's really good for that deck. The sort of deck where it's like, okay, I need certain pieces and I want to either start with them just so that when I can pull them out, I, they're necessary. So for us, for that deck, it would be like, oh, we want the hostages or the bag biters or the game days, things like that. And I think this deck actually, this idea is like really well catered for these sort of combo decks. Oh, whether diaper decks still exist or not. Otherwise, all in all, if you don't want to do combo stuff, it's all in all just good. It's just good. You get to see your opponent, see like, okay, I know what I want in my opening and my NV RAM. You can choose when to draw it. It just it encourages interesting play. Um, do be mindful about your your NV RAM though. It's not considered part of your deck. So if you're playing self modifying code, for instance, um, you're not going to be able to pull a program from your NV RAM. So you do have to be a bit mindful. There's going to be some intelligent play when it comes to that. Uh, so do just be careful, but all in all, I think this is 
great um it's interesting shaper it's very good like it's a very sort of card that i think gets better or worse depending on the meta like if the meta is super diverse i think this card gets really good because you can run a lot of like very uh very perhaps narrow counter cards and i don't like that sort of design space but the idea is that you can sit across from your opponent and have a lot of control of how good your starting game is and how good the rest of your deck is because also mind you with 45 cards and you start with four in your nv ram it's very similar in some ways of playing a 40 card deck in some ways. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, if the meta gets like pretty homogenous and you know what your opponent is playing, Bios Rahim might not be fantastic, but I think it's definitely interesting and I'm excited to play her as much as I don't play Shaper. This is careful planning. This is one of her signature cards. That's uh, that's Bios or uh, Isla herself planting her flowers, her digital flowers. It's a priority event, so you got to play this as your first click, um, and you got to choose a card in or protecting a remote server. That card cannot be rezzed this turn. It costs three, which is pretty expensive, and it's four influence, which is a lot. I don't think you're going to see this outside of Shaper. Originally, when I read this card, I totally glossed over the choose a card in or protecting a remote server. I thought it was just said choose a card in or protecting a, uh, a server. And just to understand, like, in theory, how big of a deal this card could be, imagine it didn't say that. And if it didn't say that, you could basically turn one, careful planning HQ, and then click two, sorry, click one, careful planning uh, HQ, and then click two, account siphon. And the corp couldn't res their single piece of ice, and it goes off. And it would be just absolutely disgusting, and people would hate this card, and it would be absurdly too good. Same idea if you do this, careful planning because it's the rest of the turn, right? Careful planning R&D, single piece of ice, go straight into indexing, perhaps get five agenda points on turn one. An issue, glad it's not written like this. And that's why I think this card, while it might be expensive and it's a bit, a bunch worse because it can do central servers, any card that inherently says the point in the game where the corp and the runner were going to interact, and that's generally where the corp like makes their moves based off of, it says we're not going to interact on that, uh, on that means needs to be thought of this is like similar to blackmail it's similar to uh, rumor mill and it does like parts of those cards however much more expensive and much more harder to play um it's definitely worth considering because it does inherently remove interaction from the game and that's generally where busted stuff good busted stuff if you're the runner appears so two parts of this if this is you choose a piece of ice it can be res for the end of this turn uh that's cool if you want to run the same remote server multiple times perhaps there's a caprice nase in there already res this will make it cheaper to run it's also very similar in ways to ddos or inside job although very limited this is inside job um but uh yeah what can you do it's not criminal it's not gonna be as good uh, one thing about a priority event is you have to understand if this is in your NV RAM, you're going to have to pull it out the turn before you're going to play it. By the way, you don't show when you draw out your NV RAM, like it's drawing from the top of your deck. Basically, it's like entirely hidden. Um, so you're going to have to plan around it, which shouldn't be surprising for the title careful planning. Um, otherwise, the cards cannot be res this turn. If you want to do that on a card in a remote server, that's generally going to be done on defensive upgrades. And defensive upgrades are actually a pretty hot commodity in the uh the current meta things like caprice nase are really popular ash uh, even sandberg perhaps sees play but the idea is that like, if this isn't a server and you don't have a way to deal with it running that server gets really hard it gets really hard to steal an agenda from inside there now classically the way to deal with these things was rumor mill which wasn't a shaper card if you want to put this in your shaper deck now it's five influence which is pretty hard but the other ways that you had to do that were cards like interdiction which are cool because uh they last for the whole turn I guess then their corp can play around it, but probably better off you are with councilmen. So the question is, if you're using this to counter um, upgrades, are you better off just playing councilmen, which you can play in the middle of a turn, not as priority, and you can also save three credits on, because three credits, mind you, is a lot of money. A careful planning does get a lot better if you want to play with prepaid voice pad, and prepaid voice pad and shaper and Kate specifically is really good, so maybe that's a consideration, but I'm pretty sure if you just want to fight upgrades, councilmen is probably better. Also, once they get like wind, if the corp gets wind of you uh, playing this, they'll probably just pre-res their stuff, and then this card is kind of dead. So this card is it's all right for charging remotes. It's pretty good. Uh, it's yeah, it's all right. Um, it, it's cool that in some ways it stops the corp from scoring behind a single piece of ice. But scoring behind a single piece of ice against a shaper was generally not a good thing to do, just because uh, self-modifying code exists, and with a single self-modifying code, you can generally get through one piece of ice anyway. So I don't think it it like stops a line of play that like that line of play wasn't good anyway. So careful planning doesn't help too much. This card is going to get a lot better as soon as there are more remote server uh, oper or remote server cards 
that like really reward running a remote server. Um, like, I think I'm only thinking of one right now, but basically bank job. If you play bank job, if Shaper had something like bank job, which really, really highly um, rewards you for running a remote server, careful blending starts to get really good. But again, like if this card said central server, it would be busted. The fact that this is remote server only helps you charge on one turn. And um, I'm not sure it's that good for how much it costs. Yeah, uh, yeah. if something like bank job comes out for Shaper, it gets a lot better. So just watch out for that, because I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens. I don't know. I think you can include one or two of these, two of these in your deck. You can't say Molting it, by the way, because it's priority, but uh, it might actually have some impact. And the thing is, as soon as a lot of people start playing this, uh, I think Corpse will start pre-resing their upgrades anyways. Something they should probably be doing if they respect Councilman, but um, yeah. So maybe, maybe it'll get some impact or get some work done for a while. This is deep data mining. It also costs three credits. It's a run event. Um, it's also for influence, which is nuts. Uh, you can make a run on R&D. If successful, access one additional card for each unused MU up to four. So in your best case scenario, you're paying three credits to see five cards off the top of R&D. Seeing five cards off the top of R&D is pretty good, obviously. Not only are you going to see everything the Corp's going to draw for the next couple of turns, so you don't have to worry about running R&D for a while, but also one in five is generally the number of which an agenda shows up. So one in five, you have pretty good odds of finding an agenda. You can also find two and more, or of course, you can also find zero. If you want to compare this to a card that requires no effort to get working, this is Maker's Eye. And Maker's Eye is one credit less, but you only see two additional cards. So you see three cards, while best case scenario, deep data mining for one extra credit sees you five cards. Five cards is obviously pretty good. Maker's Eye for two credits to see three is probably fine, but I think the best comparable uh, comparison to this card is indexing. Indexing's free, lets you look at the top five cards of R&D, rearrange them, and then you can always run back to get the agenda. So if there's a single agenda, only run once more. Sure, you gotta run twice, and sometimes that's more expensive than paying three cards for deep data mining, but with very little support, indexing is such a strong power card. It's also good against trap decks, it's good at rearranging things and giving you information and just changing the next four or five turns of the corpse play. But altogether, if I want an R&D pressure card, even if I have five unused, four unused MU, I'm not sure deep data mining is that much better than indexing. So there's a theme in the Shaper Breakers or all the Shaper cards in this uh, in this deluxe expansion or this campaign expansion, and it's all to do with unused MU. They have a whole bunch of breakers that get stronger the more unused MU they have, and we'll get to them when we get to them, which is relatively soon, but these are the sort of cards that uh, should come alongside them that actually incredibly encourage you to play or highly encourage you to play that sort of archetype. I'm not sure that this is of the power level that will make me want to play that archetype. Yes, this is good, but in a deck that runs three deep, deep data mining, I would still probably want to play one or two indexing or probably actually play more indexings than deep data mining. Deep data mining, by the way, gets a lot better if you play prepaid voice pad, and I think actually that gets pretty good. Um, but the idea is like I was hoping if the unused MU thing, if it's not really good, if the breakers, and we'll talk about them in a bit, if they're not fantastic, the cards that go alongside them have to be fantastic. And I don't think this card is on a fantastic power level. It's definitely playable. Uh, it's somewhere between Maker's Eye and Indexing, and I think Indexing might still be a bit better. But um, that kind of like lowers my expectations a bit of this unused MU stuff, that this card is not a reason why I would want to play it alone. Um, and that's kind of a bummer. Three credits is a lot, right? Indexing is so good. So, I don't know, it's all right. We, and, and if you play this in bad scenarios where you have only two unused MU, this becomes Maker's Eye for one credit more. Not awful, but again, Maker's Eye is better in that scenario. So you definitely need at least four, three unused MU for this thing to be worth its salt or worth the time. This is LLDS Memory Diamond. It is a uh, four to install, it's a mod hardware, and it's just a bunch of bunch of numbers, bunch of stats all put together in one. Not very exciting card, but at least I guess it's efficient, right? Um, so for four credits, you get one MU, you get one link, and your maximum hand size is increased by one. Just because we got ones all around, it's also one influence. Uh, so a bit of a backstory, if you haven't heard, LLDS is a, an acronym or an abbreviation uh, for Lucas Litzinger, Damon Stone. Lucas Litzinger is the, was the lead designer of Android Netrunner. He's the dude who rebooted this game in 2012. Uh, really good stuff, Lucas. Um, and Damon Stone was the designer who has recently stepped off the project, who designed this deluxe expansion and the last two. Um, Damon Stone, LLDS, more importantly, has shown up on a couple cards to date, and LLDS is a nice nod at those two guys. It's, I think it's pretty great. 
So this is the memory diamond. Uh, it's a nice shiny rock with some chips attached to it, and it gives you a bunch of stats. And let's look at how good these stats are, because that's the sort of thing with this card. This card doesn't do anything that interesting. It's just basically is four credits worth it for all this stuff. And let's look at it piece by piece, because we can. Hakamatsu Memchip. This is the baseline cost for MU. One credit, one MU in Shaper. All right, uh, that's a start. Global Sec, access to Global Sec. It's a neutral card, one credit, one link. Okay, we're one for one, one for one. And then lastly, we have hand size. Uh, there's no one hand size card flat out from my memory, but we do have Public Sympathy, which is two, M two install for two hand size. So let's just go ahead and wildly extrapolate that it's one MU or one credit for one hand size. So we're one, one, one to get this. Now this card costs four which you might think, total ripoff, that should cost three credits, what are you talking about? But the fact that you don't have to spend three clicks drawing or six clicks drawing and installing all these cards separately, you pay four credits up front as a bundled package. Bundling, good for consumers, good for sellers. Um, and you get this all together. Is that good? Is that worth it? I don't know. I don't really know. One MU, one link. We've actually seen this on a card before, and it's Dyson Memchip. Dyson Memchip is neutral, so you can play it anywhere. Not like one MU is hard to play, but Dyson Memchip give you one link, one MU is one credit cheaper. So the question is, either are you running three Dyson Memchips and you want the fourth one, or do you care about hand size? Hand size is actually a pretty hard thing to care about this in game. I don't love hand size, which is nuts from someone who's been playing a Severnius Theophilus Bagbiter deck for the last, like, weeks. Um, but I don't think it's phenomenal. Uh, it's never been that good. To, like, it's never been fantastic to me. It also makes some ice harder to deal with, like Kumainu and Brainstorm. It also makes Sweeps Week better for the Corp, so I don't love it. But the question is, do you want to play Memory Diamond instead of playing Dyson Memchip? I don't know. Dyson Memchip immediately, uh, admittedly is going to cycle out of the game in four months, so this is just kind of the natural replacement. Until then, I think I'd rather play Dyson Memchip. Um, it's a fair card for three, right? I just don't know if hand size actually matters that much. But that's what you got here. It's a bunch of numbers tacked together. For one extra MU, you get one more hand size. Do you want that? I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Actually, the only reason why this hand size might matter, and this actually might be a pretty good console for the, th for the thing, right? What is this thing called? Oh, I don't even know the name. We got to look it up. But this is like a, let's do this, uh, Anarch. And this might make a lot of sense based off of the, the breakers that we're running here. Uh, console let's look at these so full cards there's this one card i think it's called echo mind i think i just remember the name yeah here we go echo mind says your memory limit is equal to the number of cards in your grip so in theory if you play lods memory and you have like a hand size of six or seven and this doesn't care mind you by the hand size it cares about hand cards in your grip so make sure you don't throw out too many cards is that in theory if you play echo mind with this and this is already three influence you can have like some nuts unused mu like just an absurd amount of unused mu in theory, that can work, but otherwise, hand size, I don't know. That being said, if you want to play like the breakers uh, that need a lot of MU, I'd probably just play deep red for one influence. It gives you three MU for two credits. Like, that's really good. So, I don't know if you need to do Echo Mind. It's fun. One thing that I just want to address, because I don't I don't think I'm very clear about this, and I'm not doing the best job at this, I don't think 100% of the time, is that when I'm talking about these cards, I'm not talking about it entirely about a competitive Netrunner. I do play a lot of competitive Netrunner, but if you've seen this channel, I'm not playing that much competitive Netrunner recently. Uh, so when I talk about cards, I, I'm talking about them in just like my opinion, and that's a mixture of is it good uh, on a competitive, but also do I find it fun or do I find it interesting to do? And sometimes like if Echo Mind is worth in Deep Red, just play Echo Mine if you think it's fun. Like, if you're not playing at top tables, who cares? If you care about top tables, I think Deep Red's probably strictly better. But again, who cares how you play this game? Just do what you want to do. I'm just saying, there's a better way to do things. That's not the right way or the wrong way. Um, that's a bit convoluted, but you see what I mean? Like, don't let anyone tell you it's wrong. Uh, this is Ubax. Ubax is the Somali word for flower. Uh, from my understanding, Isla is Somalian. Or Somalian or Somali. I think it's Somalian. Somali is the language, right? Um, is a console. It's uh, five credits to put down on the table, which is a lot. Like, that's on the more expensive end of Shaper consoles. It gives you one MU, which isn't stunning considering we want a lot of MU if we want to build this absurd stuff attached to this, uh, to the rest of this um, deluxe expansion. And it says, when your turn begins, draw one card. It's a console, so one per player. That's usually how it works. As a quote from uh, Bios, uh, from Isla, talking about her pretty nanite plants. It's also three influence, so it's hard to splash. Clickless card draw. 
Has been proven to be good in Netrunner. Has been proven to be good in any game, largely. Wildside. This is on the most wanted list. It's now technically for influence if you want it in Shaper. Not that I think you should put in Shaper. But the idea is that you lose a click, it costs 3 to install, but you gain 2 cards at the beginning of your turn. Now this card got absurdly good, just absurdly good with um, the inclusion of Adjusted Chronotype, which basically you paid 6 credits, 2 cards, and then you got 2 draw at the beginning of your turn. That's good. That's just so good. It made Faust really good. It made all these other things really good. It's it's not the point. The point is that Ubax, Ubax, maybe Ubax, I don't know, cost five. So it's it's very comparable to the price of Adjusted Chronotype and Wildside. Less card slots, less clicks and install, and it gives you one MU and then one card at the beginning of each turn. It also takes your console slot, and that's kind of the biggest thing, is that console slots are worth money on their own. Like, you could be playing another console, uh, it's not like Wildside, where you can play as many resources as you want, in theory. Uh, so let's just look at the runner consoles real quick on the Shaper side, because there's other things that you probably want to play. Um, the biggest comparison off the bat is Astrolabe. And Astrolabe is something that you install for one credit at the beginning of your turn. Ah, nice, alphabetical. You pay for one credit, and you get one MU already, so, already. And then you draw one card whenever the corp creates a server. So if you get this down turn one, this is probably in like non asset fan matchups going to draw you three or four cards, maybe in the game. That's not as good as drawing one card per turn, but three or four cards is generally pretty good. If you play this against an asset spam matchup, which is something that was pretty like a pretty common thing at top tables for the last six months or so, maybe it's not so much anymore. This card would draw you 20 cards. This was the best card in your deck. And the idea is that if we want to play Ubax, you're not playing Astrolabe. And if you want to card draw a card, this is good and better in almost every way in a lot of the very important matchups where you can't afford, let alone to pay five credits for a console. So a lot of these other consoles aren't fantastic. Comet's cool. I like Comet. Maya is actually really good, I think. Mirror is okay. <laughs> Monolith. Uh, and that's it. So... Yeah, maybe the competition here isn't too tight. Maybe Ubax can see play because of that reason. But I think if you ask me, I'd much rather play Astrolabe. Because the idea is card draw is super good turn one. If you're playing Ubax, you also want it down turn one just to get the most value out of this card. However, five credits is so much money at the beginning of the game. When paying one credit with Astrolabe is almost nothing. I think if you're playing Ubax, you need to play modded. Because playing this for two credits or one credits in Kate makes this card really good. Because playing, again, one credit to get card draw for the rest of the game is fantastic. Um, the thing that bothers me most about this card is if you compare this to something like Beth Kilrain Chang, uh, which you do play for two credits, a lot of times Beth Kilrain Chang for two credits doesn't take your console slot, doesn't give you MU, will read every turn draw a card. And if the corp has more than 15 credits, every turn gain a click, which is just better than drawing a card because you can choose to draw that card if you need to, or you can do something else. And this is two credits, and this is five credits. This does give you an MU, but... Like, this is such bad comparison. Uh, like, Ubex is not looking good compared to Beth, and Beth is kind of a nonsensely good card, so that was a fight very few cards were going to win anyways. But I don't know. All I'm saying is that this is a raw stats card. Uh, how much is one card draw per turn? It's probably worth a lot, but it depends how early you're going to get this down. And I think Astrolabe is just better currently. Uh, it depends on your meta, but um, I guess if you do get this down for cheap, it's pretty good. I just wish this gave you 2 MU, because based off of the Breaker Suite that this is attached to, it would be so much more appealing. And here's that breaker suite. This is adept out of the saturation. Um, it is, uh, we're going to call this the unused MU breakers. Uh, there's probably a better thing. Maybe we call this philosopher breakers or something like this. I don't know, the Greek breakers. Um, it costs five to install, two MU. Uh, it's a fractor and a killer and an icebreaker. That's wild. We haven't seen that before entirely. And it says adept has plus one strength for each unused MU. It also has no way to boost its MU. So basically get all the MU to make this to a point where you're never going to have to boost it again. Starts at two. And now it says two credits, break a sentry or barrier subroutine. Three influence. And then it says something in Greek here. Uh, this one is adept. Adept says in Greek, according to this translation that I have in no way of verifying, it says much learning or great learning does not teach comprehension. Fantastic. Um, cool. It's on point. Um, all right. So these are the unused MU breakers. And this is the basis of the calculation of whether or not you want to do this. If you install this, it's pretty expensive at 5. Not absurd. Kind of expensive. It takes up 2 MUs on its own. So if you have 4 MU and you put this down, you have strength 4. So you have a 4 strength breaker without any other additional support, and you're definitely going to be running support for this. And it says 2 credits to break a sentry or barrier subroutine. And as a rule of thumb in Netrunner, any piece of ice breaker, ice breaker that says uh, break a subroutine for 2 credits has not seen play. 
I can't think of one breaker that has seen play with this number on it besides Knight. And Knight makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you don't have to boost Knight, similar to uh, Adept, but Knight can break anything and Knight can let you account Siphon turn one. So there's a reason Knight saw play. Knight also saw play because it dealt with Wraparound elegantly well while Eater or Faust didn't. So there's reasons to play Knight, but basically paying two per subroutine is way too much in this game to be substantial. Like that's just way too much money. Because think of it, like two credits to break a sentry subroutine, the way that sentries are balanced in this game are having low strength but having a lot of subroutines, right? So if you want to break a Surugi, yeah, fork up eight credits, or I think it's eight credits, right? You want to break an Ichi, any of the Ichis, Ichi 1, yeah, sure, you're not boosting, you're not paying credits to boost, but you're paying six credits to break this thing. Hell, if you run into a Kamainu, let alone maybe you have extra hand size because you're playing that memory diamond, it's going to cost you like ten. That's nuts. That's so nuts. That's way too much money. And admittedly, yeah, you're not going to spend money boosting a strength. So things like Cortex Lock. And Cortex Lock also, we probably have to talk about with this sort of entirely, uh, this sort of like unused MU thing. We'll talk about it in a second. The idea is, yeah, you break Cortex Lock for two credits. That's not terrible. But nine out of ten times, sentries have low strength, many subroutines. So having a breaker that just doesn't care about strength, which didn't matter, but having to pay two per subroutine is shitty. Barrier subroutines for two credits, also not fantastic because most barriers in this game run multiple subs. Yeah, sure, you can run vanilla, but you're breaking vanilla for two credits. That's not fantastic. Uh, Spiderweb for six. Oh, God, please no. Um, and then Eli 2.0, which is a new card in this pack. You're breaking this for six credits as well. Not wonderful. Very not good. Um, sure, you're saving money, not boosting, but like if you're comparing this to the best fractor in the game, call it Spiderweb again. It keeps happening. Um, you're breaking... Eli for three credits. Either of the Eli's for three credits, right? And that's like, oh, this comparison's not good. But Paperclip's the best fractor in the game, so this is such a weighted, uh, weighted comparison. Yeah, one thing I just want to talk about real quick, if this thing does take off and people are playing a lot of this unused MU stuff, Cortex Lock. Sure, you break it for two credits, but if you have a Cortex Lock and then you play Marcus Batty and you win the side game and then the Cortex Lock fires the subroutine and you have like eight unused MU because you're playing this unused MU rig, it is lethal. So careful, be careful around that because you just set yourself up for a single side game that will win the game. So you, maybe that's a bit, I don't know how often that will happen, but just be careful about that. If you're a corp and you're playing Cortex Lock and you see this stuff coming out, put your Marcus Batty where it should be. So yeah, not fantastic. Two per subroutine is too much, I think. And that's the problem with this. And then we have the next piece of Ice Savant we'll get to in a second. But like the idea about these breakers from my understanding, and this is kind of all a shaper, is that you want to put together a rig, right? You want to put together a rig that maybe is expensive, maybe has a lot of moving parts, but once it's up, it's breaking things for cheap. And that's like the shaper dream is once you were set up, we're set up and good luck taxing us out on remote servers, on central servers, because we're going to get through everything for cheap. And sure, again, with these unused MU breakers, you're not going to be spending money boosting strength because firstly, you can't. But secondly, you probably don't need to. Um, but two credits per subroutine is not cheap. And when you compare that to things like other shaper things that do kind of deliver the dream of, oh, we can break things for cheap, things like Refractor that are only one to install and you can like tear through a... Uh, you can tear through um, like a Fairchild 3 for like 3 credits if you're playing Smoke. 2 credits if you're playing Smoke with, um, what's it called, that uh, Netmer Cur. Like that's nutty. You can compare this to playing Switchblade. Heck, even compare this to playing, um, to even playing like Dagger. And you're breaking through like Sentry Ice. Yeah, you're playing Influence for this, but like with Stealth, you're breaking through Sentry Ice for no money. Compare that to Adept, which is, I, from my understanding, trying to deliver the same experience where it's like, oh, this this breaker is meant to be really good once it's set up, once you have all the MU in the world, but I still think it's worse than all the stealth options. And again, I don't think it's good. Like, it's this could be fun. Like, building this rig, I've unused MU, I can break through anything. Like, that's kind of cool, and I don't take it. But, like, on a competitive level, I think if you're trying to build a Shaper deck that breaks things as cheaply as possible, this is not the right way to do it. And that's why I want to bring up, like, this, which I mentioned before. Like, I was assuming that if this Breaker Suite wasn't a fantastic, the cards that were going to come to support it should be fantastic. Like, Deep Data Mining, I think, is still not as good as indexing in a lot of cases. But if there was, like, an event that said, like, cost two credits or something, and it said, gain credits equal to your unused MU draw card, something like that. Like, something that isn't good uh, unless you're spending a lot of MU. And even if you don't have un unused MU, like, the numbers on that card are probably crap that I just, like, vomited up. But... 
the idea is that like that card is probably mediocre in a deck that doesn't want to use it, but fantastic in a deck with unused MU. Like those are the sort of cards that I think you need to see to like really encourage me personally to play this sort of stuff. It'd be like, wow, well, these breakers are not amazing, but the support cards and make it like great, make it fantastic. And it's just like Geist. When Geist came out, people were like, what the heck is this crap? Um, and then Tech Trader came out and it's like, oh, okay, well, this card that's not that great in anybody else now makes Geist exciting to play and really, really good. And I don't think we have seen that yet when it comes to unused MU Breakers. And I'm hoping that's coming because right now I'm not sold. I'm not sold. It's a novel way to play the game. Uh, that being said, this is Savant. Very similar idea for 2 MU. Also, that's pretty hard, right? It's one uh, uh, strength, so it's a bit lower, but it's a killer and decoder. One strength for each unused MU, and it says two credits, break one sentry subroutine, or two goat gate subroutines. And the Greek here says, according to this person, Mr. Hudson, uh, there's nothing permanent except for change. Cool. Also, all these quotes are coming from Heraclitus, who's a Greek philosopher. That's his face up there, or at least what we assume he looks like. There were no photographs. Let's be reasonable. And also we should bring this up. There is another breaker that has existed a long time before called Sage, which has more Greek on it. I forgot to look up this, but very similar idea. Less strength, barrier subroutine, unused MU. We've seen this before. Now, unfortunately, hey, FFG, bad formatting alert. This happens all the time now. This should say, or up to two code gate subroutines or two code gate subroutines if able. This is actually a big mistake. Um, You'll see on all other cards that break up to two subroutines, uh, multiple subroutines, like let's just pull up uh, uh, mm, panicking, let's pull up mongoose. This is break up to two century subroutines, and this doesn't say that, which means technically if this is not UFACT immediately, and even then UFACTs are unofficial, so I'm not convinced that they actually hold any weight in tournament settings, um, as much as they're the best. Thank you, Jacob Morris, you're kind of making this game playable. Uh, if you hit a code gate, like a quandary that is a single subroutine, you cannot break it with Savant. The way it's worded, you can't. Because this says break two code gate subroutines, and you can't do that, so you can't fire it. This has to say up to two code gate subroutines. It's a very meaningful problem, which could have been solved by just copy pasting formatting from other cards. Again, we're at a point where this isn't su surprising based off of FFG's card releases for the last couple data packs in this, but like substantial problem with this card needs to be fixed, should have been avoided by just like looking at other cards. Anyways, this one, I think Savant is technically better than Adept just because you pay two credits for two code gate subroutines. And that's really cool. This is the only one that uh, like kind of is different than all the other ones um i was trying to say veers uh but yeah so that's technically better uh, it's cheaper to install it is one lower strength but paying two per two subroutines is better and i think that's the sort of thing that you need to see to make this playable because once this is up to strength and you're paying one per subroutine this is a good piece of ice it's basically like having a real good setup um what's it called a uh, study guide right and that's the dream like if you want to play things that are good once they're set up I'm not convinced Adept is it. I'm convinced Study Guide is closer to it. Now we're gonna get to it. Like these are both two MU cards, so they seem like they don't synergize well together. And when there's a card in this pack that makes them make like make, makes them much more elegant, as much as it is a combo. Uh, but the question is like, do you run all of these, or do you even like? I'm only gonna run Savant, and then I'm gonna run a proper killer and a proper uh, like sentry or barrier breaker and i'm not entirely sure like that also seems kind of clumsy because now it's taking up your mu and if you want to run a code gate breaker i don't think like there's better ones like you could run study guide but you probably could just run refractor or gordian blade or cyber cypher so i don't know like i'm not sure i think if you're going in all in the mu thing you might want to go all in on these you also could also play also also you could also play overmind um which is also really good if you're playing a lot of unused mu and this breaker is all right, same with Overmind, same with all these breakers. They do get better with E3 feedback implants, but then again, if you start spending two influence, you probably spend four influence on two cards just to make your other breakers less shit. I don't know whether you should be doing that. These cards do seem important together because this should reduce the cost of anything over two subroutines. Um, so yeah, it, maybe it's necessary, but that's the kind of thing. It's like, if you need these cards just to make these breakers palatable, other things need to come with them that make them really good. And we haven't seen that so far, but I'm hoping that'll happen. This is Egret. 
I like this card a lot. Uh, this is two to install, one MU. You install it on a resed piece of ice, and the host ice gains sentry, code gate, and barrier. It's two influence. All right. So this is like very similar to something like a modded or a paintbrush. Not modded, tinkering and a paintbrush. Um, tinkering is a one time shot. Is tinkering until the end of the turn? Or a single run? To the end of the turn. So tinkering, you pay zero, put it on a res piece of ice. This one you can do on any ice. It doesn't have to be res, so it's better in that extent. And then you can just run through it. So tinkering is kind of like an, a shaper inside job, as long as you have a single breaker. On the other end, you have Paintbrush. And Paintbrush didn't see a lot of play besides some very fun combo decks. I also saw Paintbrush excel in certain stealth decks. And we'll get to that, because I think Egret actually works well in stealth decks. But the idea is that you choose a res piece of ice, and then that gains all of them. Uh, this one says war, but this is and. I don't think it makes that big of a difference, but that's the idea. Now this card, the way it's formatted, also makes it seem very similar to a card called Parasite, which is used to be two influence, strap it on a piece of res piece of ice, and then it does something bad to that ice. Bad for the corporation. And I think that's why Egret's really good, because I think it's very comparable to Parasite. So why would you want to change the subtype on a piece of ice? It's because either, firstly, you can't break it currently, and you have an Egret, that's not the greatest case, but I see, yeah, that maybe is a case. But secondly, because you now have basically parasited the ice. So shapers are best at breaking code gates. Uh, unfortunately, the card that we're going to bring up is not a shaper card. So what does that mean? But uh, this is Yogg. If you're playing Egret and you're playing Yogg in your deck, Yogg is only two influence, mind you, because of the most wanted list, it's two influence. But if you put Yogg in your shaper deck, you can basically pay Egret and say any piece of ice that's three strength or lower, I'll pay two credits to put Egret on it, and now you break it for free for the rest of the game. That's basically identical to a Parasite. Sure, they could trash their Yogg, sure, the Egret takes up MU, but if those three things are up, you can take an ice that costs you so much money to break, and you can just make it a code gate and run through it for free with Yogg. And Yogg is the best case scenario. Sure, you can also replace this with things like Cyber Cypher or Gordian Blade or any breaker that keeps its strength through like the rest of the run. Um, but best case scenario, 100% of the time, is Yogg because it breaks it for free. Now, if there's ice on a server that's broken for free, and the corp is going to install more ice on that server because that server is now looking pretty shit. And what they're going to do is they're going to trash this ice, probably, right? If they're Maybe if they have unlimited money, they won't. But they usually trash the piece of ice that's now useless that has the egret on it just to save credits on the install cost, which makes this functionally identical to a parasite, except good in almost other all scenarios. That's good. That's really good. And sure, Yogg is great. You could also run this in stealth and then be able to like switchblade through things or just refractor through things for cheaply. Also, I guess if you wanted to, you could maybe import Morningstar for four influence just to break any five strength or lower piece of ice for one credit. Like that's really good. You can maybe even play Egret and Anarch. The idea is with Shaper, you can tutor this, but any piece of ice you hit it and you have your Morningstar installed, you can say, oh, well, it's less than five strength. I'll break it for one. And then they trash the egret, and then you clone chip it on the next piece of ice, and you're just morning starting through everything. Like, this seems proper good. I'm really excited for egret. With the clone chips with self modifying code, egret, egret, egret everywhere, and maybe ice is looking pretty bad. I think this is fantastic. Uh, it's going to be good. It's like Parasite. It's very much like Parasite, and you can use it in all other scenarios. Again, if you want to go on the Yogg path, which is technically the best because it's less influence, less MU, less to install, you might want to consider things like Net Ready Eyes. Oh, that was a mistake, wasn't it? Um, net ready eyes. Because now your Yogg is four strength, so you can take any four strength piece of ice and say, uh, okay, well, it's, uh, it's, I'm going to break it for free, so good luck with that. Uh, you can also play this with, um, what's it called? Special touch? That sounds terrible. Personal touch uh, to make it plus strength. You can put your Yogg on your Dinosaurus to make it Yogosaurus. Eager it works really well with Kit. Oh, I wrote the word lot. Uh, Egret works really well with Kit, because now the first ice is a code gate, and now you can make the second ice on the server a code gate, and you can yog through both of them, maybe. It's really good! Ice Carver, there's just so many ways to make this good. This is a really solid piece of car a card that makes you interact with ice interestingly, it makes you look at a piece of ice and say, like, okay, I'm going to break this one for cheaper because I can't deal with it well. Maybe it's similar to Parasite, maybe that's going to get really annoying where ice is now, oh, you're breaking everything for free with Yogg. And if that happens, people will play less, less than three strength piece of ice, and sure, it might have an impact on the meta, and that might be bad in the long run, who knows, but uh, it's good. This seems proper good. I don't know why I know people, more people are not talking about this. Maybe I'm over, over, I fear maybe I'm overdoing this, but this seems fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. This is Degadir. 
Deg Deer is from Somali mythology. It is a one with means one with a long ear and it's a demon. Uh, my face is covering a bit of it, but it's uh, it's a cannibalistic female demon who has long hair, uh, long ears, sorry, that hunts in Somali forest, usually eats kids, and is meant to be very comparable to the witch from the German Hansel and Gretel. So some sort of witch forest living kid eater. Uh, and that's Deg Deer there you see with her long ears. And this is more Somali. It's more league art. We love league art. Good stuff, Liga. Um, so this actually is going to be very, very poignant because of the breakers. It's a daemon. Uh, so the daemons are all named after demons. Uh, and you install two. It takes no MU, which is fantastic. And it can host a single program. When you install a program in Deg Deer, lower the install cost by one. So you can get a rebate on your five and four strength adepts and savants and stuff like that and the memory cost of the hosted program does not count against your memory limit that's why this exists that's how you play this adept and savant you get your deck deer down you pay two for it then you post your savant on it pay three for that and now it is four strength or no and that's five strength right because it doesn't take up mu and that's basically the key pin uh key pin in this whole sort of idea um Fantastic. You need that to play that. There's nothing much more to say about this. This card is very comparable to Leprechaun. And I think this card is definitely playable outside of uh, these unused MU decks. It's super good in the unused MU decks. But this is Leprechaun. Very similar. It costs two. This one does take MU up, though. And you can install programs on it that don't count against your memory limit. So that was what you would use these unused MU programs if, I think, Deng Deer didn't exist. It's also, in some ways, comparable to Sherazada if you don't want to play... Uh, or if you're playing, like, a pawn shop deck. Oh, uh, yeah, there's no way I was going to play this. It's, like, type that right. Damon doesn't work either. Anyway, Sherazada is a card host... Subtype Damon. Um, we'll find it. But it's a it's an Anarch, one influence card, no MU. When you install a card on it, you get your money. There's another E and another H. This is very comparable, and Shahrazad is gonna cycle out soon enough. Um, and Deg Deer is very similar. Shahrazad is influenced, but it gives you credits in your credit pool when you install it. Um, it also doesn't blank the MU cost. But if you're playing like an Aesop's Pawn Shop deck, I think Shahrazad is still better than Deg Deer as long as you have the influence for it. But uh, it's interesting. Good thing also about Deg Deer is you can now play this in decks that are just like have normal breaker suites, but also are running big MU stuff. So like you can run your Magnum Opus and not worry about this absurd like MU cost. You can run uh, Sneak Door Beta, which honestly I think might... Oh, it's three MU. I thought it was two influence. Okay, well, in theory, in theory, in theory, in theory. Uh, you can also run Hyper Driver. I think Deg Deer works well in that Severnius Combonius deck that even late in the game where you have things installed and you don't want to run an absurd amount of MU, you can put your Deg Deer down and always install your hyper drivers for free and always be able to use them. And then lastly, because anytime something says ignoring install or MU costs, endless hunger is worth considering. Don't know if it's good. Maybe it is with some sort of bizarre replicator combo deck. Bizarre being the card, not like bizarre, like weird. Um, and then maybe you spam out six copies of net chip, which I think is one word actually. Um, and then you have stuff to feed to the net chip. Net chip also sadly does not work well with uh, the unused MU things because they don't actually give you MU. Shame. Levy Advanced Research Lab. It's a location, ritzy, it's four to install, and you spend a click to reveal the top four cards of your stack. If any of those cards are programs, you may add one of them to your grip. Add the rest of the cards to the bottom of your stack in any order. Uh, yeah, this is not good. Uh, this is pretty not good. It's not exciting in any way. Because that's the thing, right? At least when I'm talking about cards, when I say they're not good, I don't mean exactly that they're not good in a competitive sense, which this one isn't, I don't think. But also, I don't think they're good because they're not interesting. I have no qualms playing cards or playing decks that are not like competitive standard quality. As long as they're doing something interesting or doing something fun or doing something at least comparable or not comparable, at least different to other cards. And this fails on all accounts. On all accounts. It's expensive, it's slow, it's worse than all the other options. It's just... Oh boy. Uh, this is a comparable to... Um, what's it called? Customized Secretary. I don't think we're going to get art on this one. Yeah, okay, we don't have art. It's a shame. It's a good league art. Um, when you install Customized Secretary, you get to reveal the top five cards of your stack, and then you host any number of those underneath Customized Secretary, and then you can spend a click to install one of those cards underneath it. All right, uh, when I talked about this card, you got a very similar review in the last data pack, and yeah, yeah, this is similar. Um, 
the biggest problem with this card is it's competing with self-modifying car code, a card that's so ubiquitous in Shaper and it's never going to rotate out because it came in the Shaper creation control. And we've already mentioned it like three, four times this, this review or this unboxing. So you know it's doing something. So let's talk about it. Say we want to get a program on the table, one specific program on the table, which admittedly Levy Lab is probably not the best at doing, but let's just say that's our goal. Let's talk through it. Install self-modifying code, one click. Now at any point in time, during a run, during any paid ability window, you spend two credits, find that program, install it. So our additional cost of installing any single program from our, from our deck was no extra click because you have to install the program anywhere, but it was just two extra credits. That's self-modifying code. Two extra credits, program shows up. Any paid ability window. Let's talk about Levy Research Lab. You install it, it costs four. You spend a click to reveal the top four cards of your stack. So you're showing the, the corporation what you have in your deck. Not a great thing to do. If any of those cards are programs, so this could entirely whiff. Now, I know what we said in this uh, scenario that we're picking the one card in our deck. So if you're not running multiples, this is probably going to whiff. But there's a chance also if you're not running enough programs in your deck, which again, it would be stupid to run this card if you weren't. But there's even a chance if you are running like 10, 15 programs, 20 programs in your deck that this whiffs entirely. But if any of these cards are programs, so again, hope you may add one of them to your grip. Now you add the rest of the cards to the bottom of your stack in any order. All right. And you don't shuffle. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. All right. So we're now two clicks down and four credits down. Um, and then we hopefully found a program, let alone the program. And then you spend a third click installing the program. So self-modifying code only works once, finds a specific program, costs two extra. This costs four extra and three more clicks or two more clicks, right? Because we have to install it anyways. Yeah, so that's the issue. This is not gonna win the fight against self-modifying code and self-modifying code is so much more important in this game than like, just like, oh yeah, we'll find, yeah, maybe we'll find the program I need, maybe we won't. And sure, you can find self-modifying code, I guess, but do you want it's better than paying four credits and two clicks? Just playing quality time. Just drawing cards, just like playing Diesel, just finding cards. That was kind of the issue with, uh with the last one with um, Customized Secretary, is that not only were your cards stuck underneath it, so you couldn't find them with self-modifying code, it costs two to install. So generally a lot of times you're better just drawing massively, which Shaper can do. Um, we had a thing to bring up. Oh yeah, so the only cool thing about this card is that it works with Window, and I think Window is only one influence. Yeah, it is. So in theory, if you're running this combo, and this is the only cool thing about this card, so maybe I unsold it a bit with its like cool ideas you can play with this. Is it gonna theory like use Levy, find a program hopefully put it in your grip so that's okay it's like clicking to draw it's not awful um and then add the cards to the bottom of your stack in any order so if you are playing window which you install for two credits you can draw the card from the bottom of your stack as well so you can in theory set up the bottom of your stack however as soon as you levy again uh you're gonna mess that up entirely if you use a self-modifying code or shuffle your deck you're gonna mess that up entirely so it's like pretty not great anyways but as much as it is a cute interaction this is one of the only cards that puts a card on the bottom of your deck uh besides like mr lee so eh, i don't know it's just so much worse than the direct tutoring that you can do with self-modifying code you could do with a clone chip and self-modifying code that you can do with just anything it's so expensive it's so slow even in a deck where you want to like fire this every turn because you want to install a program every turn just to like aesop's pawn shop it you're almost definitely better off playing a draw card. Like you're probably better off playing Ubax or just anything that draws you cards slowly. Earthrise Hotel is the same cost as this, right? And Earthrise Hotel just says draw six. So I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand why this exists. It needs a lot of support too. Uh, maybe, I don't know what you would need to make this good. A card that says like name the bottom card of your deck, do something like that. I don't know, something nuts. But yeah, it's just way too slow. It's not fast enough. It probably does have value within like the terminal campaign, uh, just because there is no self-modifying code if you're playing with the recommended deck list. And that's like the best part about it is that this is the 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 best tutoring that you have within those confines. But on its own, and the fact that self-modifying code will exist forever uh, makes this thing pretty weak. And I don't see myself ever sleeving this up unless other cards come out. And those cards, I can't even imagine what they would have to do. Last one, or last shaper card, mind you, Laguna Velasco, Laguna Velasco District. I think this district actually showed up in the Netrunner and the New Angeles board game. I'm pretty sure. It's been a while since I played it. Uh, it's unique, so you only have one. It's five to install. 
It's a location, Ritzy, it's a resource, it's two influence, and it says whenever you spend a click to draw a card, not through a card ability, draw one additional card. Okay, well, the, the trifecta is completed. Um, there's all these efficiency cards, uh, and there's three of them, and it kind of just runs the whole triangle of things that you can do for five influence to make your clicks more efficient. Uh, let's run through them. Magnum Opus. Magnum Opus put down for five. It's a program, takes up MU, and now instead, every time you click for a credit, you click for two credits. Getting money is good. This is the most efficient way to make money, just like repetitively, repeatedly make money, so it definitely has value. Um, professional Context also is another card, also won't cycle out of the game. You put this down for five. It is a resource. It's also a connection. And then you can spend a click to gain a credit and draw a card. It's also two influence, so you can, in theory, splash it and like tutor with hostage. Now we got Laguna Velasco, which like just completes that. It's not even a triangle, right? It's like a line, huh? Just a spectrum of ways to spend your clicks. And this one says, whenever you draw a card, draw two cards. All right. So if you're playing this, you're not running Professional Contacts. If you are running Laguna Velasco, if you want to be cute, you also can run Symmetrical Visage, which actually makes that click really good. Because if you spend a click drawing a card, you gain two cards and a credit, at least the first time of your turn. That's actually pretty cool. But, um... The question is, in a Shaper deck, if you're going to run one, would you rather run Professional Contest or rather run Laguna Velasco? And if you ask me, I would almost always say Professional Contest. And the reason why is that when you're drawing cards, you're going to need money to play them. Um, I guess there's an argument that if you build like a really bursty econ deck, uh, maybe like a pro code, uh, sorry, more like a prepaid voice pad deck, maybe Laguna Velasco is better. But I think if you're playing a prepaid voice pad deck, you have enough like quality times and diesels that you don't have to worry about card draw at least from my understanding. But the idea is if you ask me, would you rather have card draw and money or would you rather have flat card draw? And it's not like a burst thing. I'd want money with my card draw just so that if I'm drawing cards, I'm still putting pressure on the corpse so I can still get into the servers and I can still play the cards that I'm drawing into. I think professional context is really good for that. Um, now, would I ever want a card that draws two for a click? Maybe? I'm not convinced I wouldn't shape her. And that's the thing about this card. It's too influenced, so it's easily splashable. In Criminal, you can install this for cheap with Career Fair, which makes it a lot more palatable. Because cr Criminal, besides like getting an early um uh getting an early uh Aaron Moran, don't have that good card draw. Like Blockade Runner, I don't think it's fantastic. So the idea is if you do career fair then it's early, it makes a draw draw for two, and that actually might be very good in criminal. I think Anarch probably doesn't need the card draw right now either let alone for two influence. I don't know if it's possible. But like, I'm just, I don't think this card's the best in Shaper that has access to professional context, which I think is almost strictly better. Maybe if you're running this in a deck that needs cards in hand because you're running Faust or Echo Mind or any of this other like stuff, maybe it's okay. But I just think Shaper doesn't have a problem with getting cards in hand and when they need them, but they'd rather have money when that comes to it. I, maybe this is a preference. I don't know. It's definitely a fine card. I think it's going to do a lot of work. Like th these basic cards are unassuming, but they're really good. Like that doubles the effectiveness of your clicks and card draw is kind of hard to get in this game uh it's a lot of times more valuable than a credit as much as i like proco better but we'll see maybe this sees play outside maybe this sees play in, in criminal it's probably the one faction that runs it better this is also super good in the neutrals uh not so much apex but having this down turn one career fairing it out in sunny is probably really great uh i don't think you need to do that in um adam because adam does have built-in card job but that's it's definitely something it's going to be around forever it's just like a solid fundamentals card it's not exciting it might be good later on it might be good depends on the meta but yeah proco is also a thing so kind of make your decision there all right two neutral cards we're almost done here on the runner side this is dean lister uh two credits it's a connection resource so that off-campus apartment is getting more and more credit every month uh trash it Trash ability, play Geist, choose an Icebreaker until the end of the run. That Icebreaker has plus one strength for each card in your grip. Interesting. Uh, we've actually seen cards like this before, and I don't think any of them have seen that much play. Uh, Security Chip came with Sunny, and this one's a bit different because I think it goes off Link, right? And that's generally not as much. So this one's same idea, install for zero, it's cheaper, it's hardware, and then choose an Icebreaker or all the Cloud Icebreakers. This is one Icebreaker too, right? Um, and it gets plus one strength for each link you have. Okay. Yeah, not fantastic. Use only during a run. And this doesn't say that. I don't know whether that matters or not, whether that's poor formatting. Maybe that does matter. Does that matter? Um, and then the other one, which is actually closer to this in some ways, is Helpful AI, uh, which is a connection as well. And you could trash this to give an icebreaker plus two strength until the end of the turn, 
which is pretty good. It also gave you one link. So these are comparable cards, but those cards didn't see a, a monumental amount of play. Now, why this card is interesting um, is it gives plus one strength to cards, and that's super good for decks that can't... Sorry, yeah. This will usually give plus four to plus five strength. And that's really good um, if you're playing the, these sort of like fixed strength uh, unused MU breakers. Maybe you're running against a uh, corporate troubleshooter. Maybe you're running against, uh, what's it called, a Sandberg. And maybe you need strength. Maybe you just don't have the unused MU right now. And this is what you need in a pinch. And this can help those things get into servers. That's okay. This also does do work with Mimic and Yogg and all these other fixed strength breakers. And maybe helps you deal with those. Um, that being said, we've seen other boosting cards like this before. We've seen cards like, uh, oh, Injection Attack. And Injection Attack is comparable to this. It's cheaper, it's more limited. Uh, yeah, so like these are similar. Injection Attack doesn't get a lot of play either, so I'm not convinced Dean Lister is going to see that much play. Um, best thing about Dean Lister and Injection Attack is if you're using a single Icebreaker, this actually, like it says choose an Icebreaker. So you get the most value out of this if you're actually using the same Icebreaker to break every card in, the, in, in Ice in the server, or in front of the server. So you actually get the most value about this if you're playing AI. And we don't have art for this, I don't think, but we talked about Mammon on the criminal side of things. Oh, we do have art. And if you play Mammon with Dean Lister, they work really well together. Because say you're using Mammon to get to three pieces of ice, uh, one is two strength, the next is four strength, the next is like five strength, and you play Dean Lister, uh, you save yourself like 10 credits. Yeah, you pay two for installing Dean Lister. So you basically save eight credits, um, which makes it a really good economy card. It, it becomes less of a utility card and more of a straight economy card if you're using something like an AI. Same thing if you're running Faust, it saves you cards and hands, which is kind of ironic with how this works. Um, I'm not actually sure when this calculates it, whether it's like an ongoing effect or whether it counts the cards in your hand when you fire it off or whether that changes while you're running because that goofs things with Faust pretty significantly. Um, yeah, that's Dan, Dean Lister. It's a connection. It uh, boosts ice strength. Uh, one thing to bring up, just because, again, I don't understand why this thing exists, compare this to pushing the envelope, which costs more. It's a run event, so you can't keep it on the table. It says make a run. If you have two or fewer cards in your grip, which is something that's very hard for you to control, each icebreaker has plus two strength. Sure, it's each icebreaker, but like compare these two cards, and I don't see if this, like, if this never sees play, how is this ever going to see play? I don't get it. I just, this card makes no sense to me. Sorry to bring that up. Uh, whoa, did they spell Mad Zellinger wrong on this card? Did they? Is that, or is that just like a goo, like, mm, I gotta look into that. Maybe that's just a bad scan, but it looks like they spelled Mount Zellinger wrong. Maybe I don't know how to spell Mad Zellinger. Like, we don't have time for this now. This is the last card. This is the Shadow Net. It's a virtual resource. It's unique, so there's only one Shadow Net. You got zero credits to install this. Is it Mad Zellinger? No. Uh, I feel ignorant now. Maybe, okay, it's not the time. Um, Forfeit an agenda click forfeit agenda play an event from your heap ignoring all costs okay this is a, a runner card that lets you forfeit agendas to play events if this was a jemison card that would play operations this would be the most busted card ever uh it would be so good it would be broken actually but uh we don't have that poor jemison we have forfeit agenda on the runner side which doesn't have a lot of combo opportunities like jemison we haven't seen like a runner that gets better whenever they forfeit agenda so we just got to calculate this at face value forfeiting an agenda is a pretty steep cost 100 percent is a pretty steep cost um in shaper there's ways to make that not a steep cost by playing fan site which eventually you might get two or three of these in your score area and then you can forfeit these at almost no cost so that's kind of cool uh, but on its own, if you're forfeiting agenda, the effect of this thing has to be pretty good. And this says you get to play event from your heap, ignoring all costs. And ignoring all costs means a couple of things. It means you don't pay the credit value if this costs like five or six. And if any card says additional cost, you must do this. You must destroy this. You must whatever. You get to ignore that too. So just looking at the credit thing, these are all the events in the game. And I was super surprised to find out. I did not know this. That the most expensive runner events in the game, uh, or the second most expensive, are Levy and Sure Gamble. Sure Gamble is the, the, one of the most expensive events in the game. So in theory, if you forfeit your agenda, hopefully it's a fan site, you can play Sure Gamble and just gain nine. Which sounds good, but then you got to like look at this and see, like, oh, wait a second, Data Dealer exists since the core set and nobody played this. Um, which says forfeit event agenda gain nine and you don't even need to sure gamble the heap which isn't like a hard condition but right so that's not fantastic levy's cool i guess you save five credits get a levy from your heap if your levy's thrown out 
But is forfeiting an agenda better than just playing same old thing? I don't think so. Like, of course, you can just play same old thing. And yeah, you'll pay five credits for your levy, but you also have another agenda, which if you're not playing fan sites, that's generally the way you win the game. So that's, I don't think that's the way you play it. For what it's worth, the most expensive event is high stakes job. And in theory, you can forfeit agenda to perhaps gain 12 credits. That's not that much better than just playing data dealer or sure gamble. So who knows? Also, in theory, you can forfeit to play a day job and gain eight, which is worse than sure gamble. So don't do that. Uh, no, you gain 10, which is technically better than sure gamble. So eat your heart out, data dealer. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, so that's not fantastic. That's just not fantastic. So you probably want to be forfeiting something else. Like you don't want to do financially. You want to forfeit something that has like a different additional cost attached to it. And these are the list of all the cards. There's 21. I guess we'll do full, full cards and then we'll just lose trade in. Oh, that one actually matters. But these, oh, no, that's not right. Uh, sort by full cards these are all the cards that have an additional cost to them. You'll notice a lot of them are uh, doubles. So the idea is you can play any double not playing a double. Is that worth a forfeiting agenda? Probably not. Um, other ones, like this one's hilarious. As additional cost to play this event, uh, spend a credit, and then you still have to forfeit an agenda. I thought the forfeit agenda would be additional cost. It isn't. Uh, yeah, just not fantastic stuff. I think the only two that are interesting is that you have a uh, price of freedom that as additional cost, you have to trash an insult connection so you can get around that and trade in, which as an additional cost, you have to trash an installed piece of hardware. But then this trade in gets really bad if you don't actually install a piece of hardware. It just currently nothing really makes sense with this card. All of the events uh, from your heap, uh, like none of them give you that much value where you, uh, by dodging the, the additional cost or the, any cost whatsoever, that I don't see yourself forfeiting agenda, let alone building a fan side deck around it. If you want to build a fan side deck around it, yeah, maybe you are saving two influence by not playing data dealer if you're doing this in Shaper, which I assume you would be with fan site. But otherwise, like if I want to just recur an event, I'd rather play same old thing any day of the week. Um, so I don't know. Also, for what it's worth, like recursion just got a lot worse in this game with Scorpios coming out, uh, which is we'll talk about soon enough on the corpse side. So recursion actually doesn't seem like that good of a thing to rely on. So I don't know whether you want to spend all that time recurring stuff that might not just work out for you at all. Um, best thing, I guess, about this card is that it is virtual. So it does technically give a recursion option. That's a resource that you don't spend influence on Apex. So you can recur your levy or in theory, recur an apocalypse if somehow you get extra clicks in your turn. Oh, no, it doesn't matter because it takes a click to play this. Yeah, so you can recur an apocalypse. Okay. Uh, all right. But that's Shadownet. Um, currently, not fantastic. And that's kind of the thing about this card. And I think uh, it's really important that the designers realize this, that the existence of this card, which alone is not fantastic, actually does strongly impinge the design space in some ways. Um Imagine that there was an event being printed in the near future that said something like uh, cost 18, we'll call this monolith event, and it says like look at the top 10 cards of your deck, install 3 programs for free. Something like that. Like maybe that card, I, I don't think a lot of times cards that have a really big costs are that good for the game because it a lot of times re encourages you to just like sit on magnum opus or something like that. But the idea is that if an event rolls around that has a really strong cost, something like that, or maybe an event that says as an additional cost, forfeit your turn next turn or something like that, which probably isn't good design anyways. But the point being is I don't think FFG can print those cards anymore. Right? Like, as soon as a, a card comes out, like that monolith event that says cost 18, look at the top three cards, you can play it for free. So any card that was balanced off of having like a really, really strong play cost is now completely avoided with Shadownet. Yeah, you have to sacrifice the agenda, but with Fansight, maybe that's not that difficult. So the problem is you just, like, I think FFG has to be mindful about this one, and the inclusion of this card does in some ways heavily impinge the event design space. I think that's kind of a shame considering that this card is not exciting on its own. Um, and I hope they're they're aware of this sort of thing. Um, so for that being said, like the shadow net could suddenly get amazing as soon as a new data pack comes out where there's like an event that is costs like 15 credits and is a triple or something like that. So maybe this card will get good at some point, but I think if that happens, it's gonna be kind of busted uh, more than anything else and it might not be great. 
that's it. We did it. Those are all the running cards. That took us a couple hours. Um, thanks so much for watching. A lot of good stuff here on the Shaper side. I'm really excited to play Isla. I think uh, I'm not that into this whole like other extra MU thing, but I think Egret's like really solid and should open up a lot of like really good ways of dealing with ice, which is kind of the idea of these. Shame, shame, shame. Uh, Deg Deer is cool. I think Laguna Velasco might be like some cool basics to play in some maybe criminal decks. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think it's that great in Shaper. And I think uh, well, the neutrals weren't fantastic, were they? I'm excited to play this. If you're playing uh, Raheem in the in what in the story campaign, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. They have to deal with all her breakers and worry about unused MU. I know there's a bunch of advanceable ice that actually boosts in strength in Wayland, so that seems kind of rough. But I guess you'll see how that goes. Um, thanks so much for watching. If you have any cool things that you're excited to build with these decks, uh, with these new cards, any interactions that I might have missed that are worth pointing out, please do point them out. There's a lot of cards here, uh, so I'm gonna definitely miss some cool stuff. Um, most of all, thanks so much for watching. We'll have the corpse side of this. We'll probably divide it into two parts as well, coming out later this week. So do stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for watching, and ciao.